Hello and welcome to The One Show with Christine Blake. And Adrian Charles. And tonight, a very fine actor who's played a world leader. Well, you obviously know my job better than I do. Well, you are my tenth Prime Minister, Mr Blair. And you played the interviewer who called a world leader to account. Are you really saying that in certain situations, the president can decide whether it's in the best interests of the nation and then do something illegal? I'm saying that when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Michael Sheen. <laughs> going to get uh, an OBE from Her Majesty the Queen, oh, so yes. presumably, um, presumably sort of Blair and the Queen were both happy with your portrayal of Blair in the... Uh, uh, well, we'll find out in June, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you would have got one in the first place, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, maybe not. They didn't know. So I think they think I'm Barry Sheen or something. <laughs> Martin, Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen. Yeah. <laughs> one of those. Um, I suppose Brian Clough himself would be dead chuffed to be in the exalted company of a Prime Minister and... Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and but I think, I think he'd want to know why it isn't a trilogy, why it's just the one film, Yeah, I think. <laughs> if it was good enough for Lord of the Rings, it'd yeah. be... Good enough for him. Well, I watched it today, and I'll be very happy with the trilogy. I promise you, <laughs> fantastic stuff. Yeah, I look forward to uh, hearing about it shortly. Um, though it uh, might not seem like it sometimes, we do try to use plain English here on the One Show, even though we mangle it a bit from time to time. Yes, you do. Uh, to its uh, credit, the uh, local government, the local government association, is cracking down on some of the impenetrable language that local authorities use. Running along your screen right now are some of the words they've suggested are actually not worth using at all. I can see some personal favourites. It's in their level playing field, thinking outside oh, the box. I've done all one. of these. Single point of contact is absolutely essential for me, as is <laughs> stakeholder engagement. I'll miss them <laughs> if they do that. We sent Melanie Sykes off to talk some proper gibberish. So we need a gateway review of holistic government policy so we can maximise the freedoms and flexibilities of funding streams. Across the piece, if we utilise service users, we can seabed the idea and pick off the low-hanging fruit. With this innovative capacity, we can test the elephant hunting ideal and through blue sky thinking, encourage movement with integrated enterprise-wide knowledge. Now, this may all sound like gibberish, but this is a sample of some of the phrases used in boardrooms up and down the land. There is no reason for any form of jargon. The reason why jargon has come about is a lot to do with control and power of information. We need to speak in plain, simple, pure English. And if councils aren't speaking in plain English, then people won't know how to get the services that they can access. What are the worst offenders for you? I find that engage is the one that really uh, annoys me, I think, more than anything else. The only time the word engage should be used is either when you're getting married or on, or on a toilet door. <laughs> so, do you know your baselines from your blue sky thinking? You are? This word fulcrum, what do you think it means? I have absolutely no idea. Eh? I think they probably mean that they have slipped or moved from what they're trying to achieve. Well, it actually means delay. What do you mean? It means talking to people. Aha, bingo! Not everyone thinks this language is such a bad thing. Jargon does have a place, but only when people understand what you're talking about. So if you are talking in a room, for example, of accountants or a room full of medics, using the language that they understand and that they frankly expect you to use. If you're not talking to them in their language, you're the one that's going to look foolish. Using jargon is a good way of making sure that communication is quick, efficient and concise. So why are you creating a new language instead of just speaking English? Well, when you're talking amongst people who understand the same language as you, it is a language that they understand and that's when jargon is absolutely right. This is the seedbed that encourages the co-terminosity between local authorities and ends the top-down use of jargon. Shouldn't we simply just talk to each other? Well, yes, that would we be the simple yes. answer, wouldn't it? As long it? as we can all understand what the other one's well, saying. That would help, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. You've got a great example of how this, it's not exactly dangerous, but just totally confusing in terms of local democracy even. Someone of the Bradford Council website. Yeah, but say, for, you know, we'd like to know where our council tax money goes, yeah? If you go onto the Bradford Council website, this is what they'll say. Councils are required to have economy, efficiency and effectiveness in their actions, and efficiency saving occurs when the cost of an activity falls, but its effectiveness is 
not reduce, which translates as we'll do more for less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that so, wouldn't take up enough space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should just put it in bigger letters or something, shouldn't we? But does someone just sit in an office and decide, I'm going to make myself sound smarter yeah. by just elongating my sentences? Mm. It is it's, it's but, but it, 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 But it, if, as a reader, you feel slightly stupid not being able to understand it. It diminishes yeah. someone, mm. I think. But if you don't understand, it's not your fault. It's their fault mm. for writing like well, that. Well, exactly, it's yeah. It's but we all tend to think, I, I know I do, and I think people do feel like if you don't understand what someone's saying, I always think it's because I'm being stupid. But yeah, exactly. All this kind of stuff just generates a whole country of people right. thinking they're stupid. <laughs> yes, that's it's not right. true. It's not very I mean, what we got there, Michael, is sort of management speak, but is the mm. kind of film production speak. You know, in, in television, for example, yeah. always been, I can't tell you how many programs I've been told are going to deconstruct the genre. I never yeah. know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> and it, do this, and it certainly never achieves it anyway. Yeah. So whatever it was. Well, as an actor, if you come up with an idea and you go up to the director and say, look, I've had this idea for this, how we can do this thing in this scene. If the director says to you, that's a really interesting idea. <laughs> That's director speak for it's rubbish. <laughs> and we're not, we're not doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff happens a lot. And when people come backstage to see you offer a play, oh, yeah, so and the things they say, you know, and you have to deconstruct it right. to work out what it is, you know, you've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Or uh, how did you feel it went? <laughs> yeah, did you enjoy it? <laughs> you looked like you were enjoying yourself out there. <laughs> All that because it means it was rubbish. No, oh, dear, we'll look out for that. Melanie's got something. You that you okay, can we've got the one show yeah. jargon bingo. It's a bit of fun. You can yeah. download, download this on the website. If you're in an office and you hear any of these yeah. words, so we've got symposium, which actually means meeting, yeah. <laughs> believe it or not. Um, we've got meaningful consultation, which is basically having a chat. Yeah. So if you hear any of these words in the office over a period of the day, you take them off, the person to get four in a line or horizontally or diagonally, Wins. I don't know what you win. Wins a prize. Wins yeah. a prize. It's win, just a bit win of a fun. funding stream. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah, well, so that's email. on the website. If you, if you can construct an email with all of those <laughs> yeah. things in, then, oh, uh, send then that do, to us. Yes, that do send good. it to us. Or if you've got some personal bet noir, some personal favourites or or not favourites, if you see what I mean, do let us know on the website. <laughs> that would be great. Mel, nice to have you on. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. Now. Uh, here's, here's what I know, or what I thought I knew, about getting someone to fit or service a gas appliance. All you've got to do is make sure they're Corgi registered. Well, it turns out it's actually not that simple. And Lucy Siegel's met a family who, like us, didn't understand that and paid a devastating price. Alex Mitchell from Cumbran in South Wales. A happy teenager, popular at school and full of life. Alex would be 18 now, but four years ago she died when a badly fitted gas fire leaked lethal amounts of carbon monoxide. It was Good Friday. She asked me for a CD for Easter. I've got the CD. Mum, can I have it? Can I have it? No, wait till Easter Sunday. I never could give her that CD. This man, Scott Stewart, fitted the fire which killed Alex. He pleaded guilty to her manslaughter. I came home about four o'clock, put the key in the door, and you sensed that there was something wrong. I was screaming for Alex and um, went up the stairs and all I could see was her feet laying on the bedroom floor and she was fully clothed um, and she was dead. And that's when my life effectively ended. You just go through the motions after that. Anne thought she'd done everything right to get the fire fitted safely. She chose an engineer who was Corgi registered, someone legally allowed to work with gas appliances. But Anne didn't realise that there are different categories of Corgi registration, and Scott Stewart was not qualified to install a flueless gas fire. The logical side of you says, he wasn't qualified, it's not my fault. The parental side of you says, what if, all the time. And you live with that daily. You can't resolve anything that's happened. You can't put right anything that's happened. You get one shot at gas, and if you mess up, that's somebody's life. Concerned about the risks of badly fitted gas appliances and our own lack of understanding, the government is overhauling the system. From the 1st of April, Corgi will cease to be the legal register of gas installers and the new gas safe register will take its place. The aim, to make the focus on safety much clearer. They say they're also going to raise awareness about the importance of checking which specific types of work gas installers are registered to do. 
something that could have prevented at least one death. The whole family's health and life is in that fitter's hands. Just double check the credentials and get a carbon monoxide detector and then you won't have Christmases and birthdays like mine without my Alex. And an absolutely ghastly story, Lucy. Um, but Corgi is no more from April 1st, isn't that correct? Everything kind of changes then. That's right. From April 1st, it becomes the responsibility of the gas safety register. Um, now, this is not a commercial body. It's just focusing on gas safety, which is good news. So it's run by the health and safety executive, and that's their priority. There's going to be more inspections, 4,000 more inspections, and more money going into that. So some people would say, you know, about time, but it, at least it's happening now. OK, so you, you look at the logo on the gas fitters advert or whatever, it says gas safe, then you're all right. Have you, or you've got to ask another question, are you, are you fit to, to do this particular gas fire? Exactly, so you must be very clear. Now we're just going to show you the makeup of the, of the new card that you must look out for. So um, if we just look at this, that number in the middle is the license number for the gas fitter. It's now about the individual rather than the company that they work for. That is the number that you need to check. Now you can do that on the internet, you can send a text and they will text you back a photograph of the person who corresponds to that number or you can phone them up directly. Now on the reverse of this card, which is really, really important, like you said, Adrian, um, it tells you what exactly they're qualified to do. Yeah. Um, and the date on there is the date up to which this is current. Yeah. If, that doesn't, if that doesn't fit, send them away. Don't let them do the job. Okay, Lucy, thank you very much. That makes sense. And um, there are more details as well about the new gas safe system on our website, bbc.co.uk slash the one show. Michael, The Damned United, a film about Brian Clough at Leeds, is out uh, this week. I saw it today. It strikes me as a, you're a football fan of a certain vintage, a bit like me. So, Brian Clough is writ large in our imaginations. You yeah. must have been thrilled when they, when they suggested you could play him. I was, I was. I was thrilled and scared to death, really, you know, taking on the idea of playing someone like Clough. You know, I, when I was growing up, I was, what, I was five years old, I guess, when the events of the film took place in 74, but... It was, it was years before I realised Clough was a football manager. I just thought he was, like, a star. Mm. Yeah. You know, he was on the TV all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Back, in the, back in the 70s, you know, you'd have those Saturday night TV programmes like, uh, the, I guess, Yarwood, Parkinson, Match of the Day, and he'd be on all three. He'd be on all night, yeah. actually, wouldn't he? Yeah. Well, we, so there's a, a great clip here. You're on a bus stop with the Derby uh, City chairman, mm. um, Sam Longson. And, actually, Brian Clough, bless him, he's making a very good point here, I think. And that's where you'd still flaming be if it wasn't for me. At the foot of the blooming second division, nobody remembered you and nobody had heard of you. There would be no Derby County without me. No league title, no champions of England, not without Brian Clough. Oh, oh the fantastic. power there. Give a round of applause for that. Jim Broadbent in that clip yeah. who plays Longson, he's got these fantastic ears that yeah. they made for him because Longson had really <coughs> large ears. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Jim got very uh, interested in the idea of recreating these ears. So he was more interested in that, I think. Than <laughs> than <laughs> than <laughs> bigger. You know, I went to watch it today as well, Michael, and I wouldn't know as much about football as you gentlemen, but I. I liked it as a story and about mm. the person as opposed to the football thing. So yeah. it kind of appeals to everyone. This isn't just a football story. This no, I think, might yeah, it's, today. you know, football, the world of football is the backdrop to it. And if you're into football and, and you know Clough and you know the events, then you'll really enjoy it. But I think it's, he's a fascinating man. You know, he's a man of so many contradictions, Clough. Mm. And, uh, and, a, and he was a genius. Apart from his achievements, he was just yeah. great on TV. He was an entertainer and a showman. And this story just shows all that off. Yeah. But more of a, by way of a, a point of reference, we can... <laughs> Show, uh, show you the real thing now and uh, you see how uh, close our man here does get to the great man. Just a, a short clip of uh, Brian Clough speaking. Dictators are out, but I would love to be the perfect dictator. And you even look a bit like him. There's an unhappy time at Leeds United, but... Uh, you know, it's uncanny resemblance. Yeah. Really. Well, it's straight, I had two the things. It's straight, <laughs> that, that bit of footage there when yeah. he was in the Leeds United stuff. Yeah. Um, well, we, we shot a lot of the film at Elland Road, at Leeds United Stadium. Yeah. And, there was one bit where I was in all that kit and, I'd, and we were doing the stuff on the training pitch and I just needed to go to the loo. So I ran yeah. into the stadium to go to the loo. Yeah. And when I came back out again, at the end of that little bit of footage you saw then, he comes up some steps and gets yeah. back onto the training pitch. And as I was running up the steps to go back to filming, I realised, oh my God, I'm, I'm in the footage that I've watched over and over again. Yeah, it was a real yeah, goosebump yeah, moment. Yeah, thinking, yeah. That's so weird. And that little bit of thing where he said, uh, 
dictator. dictators are out, but I would love to be the perfect dictator. Yeah. Um, that I listened to over and over again. I had on a little it's dictaphone. Absolutely oh. fantastic. I mean, just, just one more thing from the, from the film. Um, there's this, um, just see, you know, you were some footballer in your youth, yeah. I'm told, and you were showing it off a bit here. Peas in a pod, me and Don. Two peas in a blooming pod. Right, you saw that? That's the way you do it. I do some sports broadcasting in a, um, in, a, in a kind of a different life every Sunday night. Mm. So I just want to analyse your technique here. All when right. here we see the, the boy Sheen, you can see the ball coming. He's got a nice soft chest, cushions it and turns and volleys it into the empty net. Well, oh, I know. Yes. How many takes did that take? Come on. One take. Oh, One take. Please. Actually, no. It took two takes because the guy who was throwing the ball at me. Oh, he got it wrong. No, yeah. it was him got, got it wrong. wrong. You see, you get this ability, yeah. obviously, this, uh, you, it is uncanny the way that you can recreate these characters. And we, we found out why today. It's yeah. all because of your dad, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Mm. Explain what your dad does in a bit well, of a... a Another life. And right. he watches the one show. Yes. Yeah. Hello. So Hello, Dad. Lovely to have you, my Eric and Irene. Hello, Dad. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, my dad uh, started to become a Jack Nicholson lookalike. Well, I can yes. see why. Looking at the picture. Yeah. I mean, he looks he's better than Jack Nicholson. I don't know which like. ones. Which ones are the same? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely outstanding. That's Mr. Sheen on the left. Just okay. in case. Okay. Listen, we're changed. never going to get Jack Nicholson on the show, so we might as well just get, get your, your dad. dad. No problem. You've got an open invitation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this week is Food Science Week on The One Show. Woo! Yes. Excitement. <laughs> and Michael Mosley <coughs> starting off with the good news. Yes, there's a few ifs and buts and maybes, but the bottom line is that chocolate could be extremely good for you. We all know what healthy foods look like. They're generally green and crunchy. We also know what not a healthy food looks like, full of fat or sugar. But life is not always that black and white. Chocolate is one of my guilty pleasures. Now, until recently, I would definitely have put chocolate into the bad for you category. But there are some scientists who claim that eating chocolate, as long as it is dark, has potential health benefits. But what's the proof? I've come here to Ealing Hospital, where they're going to try and measure the effects of eating chocolate on my arteries. There's an ingredient in cocoa called procyanidin, which may help stave off heart disease. To test this idea, I first have the width of my arteries measured with ultrasound. Then at last, the chocolate. But this chocolate is dark, bitter, and really only for nibbling. I've actually lost my taste, I have to say. It sort of dries up your mouth. Our experiment was inspired by a discovery in Central America. It's been known for some time that the Kuna Indians of Panama, who drink a lot of cocoa, have incredibly low levels of cardiovascular disease. Researchers looked at this population and found that it was their, their dietary habits of consuming cocoa that were the likely source of protection from that. Roger Corder believes it is the procyanidin in the cocoa which is the most important factor. This seems to make blood vessel walls more flexible and so help protect against cardiovascular disease. We think they trigger the release of a gas which is nitric oxide. That dilates blood vessels. And what we've seen in previous studies is, is you can actually get a bigger response after cocoa or after dark chocolate than if, if people don't, don't consume those. But has it worked for me? Two hours later, I'm tested again. We're nearly done, and in a moment, Jeff is going to measure whether the chocolate has actually had an effect. Has it sort of loosened the walls of my artery and allowed it to expand? Cardiac technician Jeff Jean-Marie uses ultrasound to measure the maximum diameter my brachial artery can stretch to. He first stops the blood flow with a blood pressure cuff and then lets it come flooding through. Okay, I'm going to release the cuff very still for me. Tell me, I've never heard my own blood supply. Will my artery now be wider and more flexible than when he measured it before I ate the chocolate? So do you have a result then? We do. Your artery has changed its diameter positively 
after having had that wonderful chocolate. So the chocolate did have an effect? It had an effect. The chocolate really did make my arteries more flexible. As we age, this becomes increasingly important because our blood vessels tend to harden up, leaving us more prone to cardiovascular problems. So does that mean we should eat chocolate to reduce our risk of heart disease and stroke? Well, no. Sadly, milk chocolate has had all the procyanidins removed. They are only found in the bitterest, darkest chocolates. At the moment, they don't put the procyanidin levels on the labels of even the darkest chocolates, so you simply don't know what you're getting. But there are other foods you could try too. Cranberries, red wine, and apples. Not chocolate, but guaranteed packed full of procyanidin. Well, he's rather ruined it there, hasn't he? So you might as well just go and eat an apple. And the other bad news is the chocolate tastes absolutely rubbish. This yeah. is good stuff. Oh, look, I've got a huge bunch on that. Mm. The very, other good news better. is that a token of our esteem, we oh, fashioned don't drop it. out of this special healthy chocolate <laughs> something that's supposed to be a likeness of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody's pointed out it looks more like the Queen than you. Well, <laughs> Jeremy Paxman, yeah. maybe. It a looks like half old Mark. Yes. <laughs> well. Listen, it's yours to take home anyway. Yeah. So you seem very self-effacing, but if you do fall in love with yourself, you can eat yourself in chocolate. Yeah. I've always said I'm as good as chocolate. Even <laughs> the frame is edible, go, apparently. You. That's all yours, wow. Michael. What's yeah. next? Bugs. Did you marvel on that, yes? Yeah. Our bug man, George McGaffin, will be joining us shortly. Today, he's crawling all over the subject of a creature that's small, rather slimy, and not especially well-loved. Which is a shame, because without these little creatures, you'd have no soil. If we didn't have soil, we wouldn't have plants. If we didn't have plants, We'd all die. But don't worry, George is on the case. There's one group of animals that are generally undervalued, unloved, and under our feet. I'm talking, of course, about this, the humble earthworm. Yet even though Charles Darwin wrote a whole book about these creatures, we still know relatively little about their distribution across the UK. But with your help, all that's about to change. You just think. Right. Okay, you all set? Right, who's, who's having a spade? Great for you. An earthworm survey is taking place all across Britain, and scientists are asking you to get involved. This is something anybody can do. It's absolutely free. All you need is a patch of open ground with soil and this. The Open Air Laboratories Earthworm Kit. Amongst other things, it contains a workbook, a field guide, a little mustard, a drizzle of vinegar, and a magnifying glass. Ew. Oh, look at and as someone who loves all things that creep, crawl, and slither, I'm itching to get started. And worm guide for you. Hi, Maria. Hi, What's good. this survey trying to find out? Well, the Opal survey is looking at earthworm distributions in different soils across the UK and also at the soil quality, because earthworms are a really good indicator of how healthy our soils are. Now, in, the, in Great Britain, there are 26 species of earthworm. How many species do you think we'll find here today? Well, we probably won't find all 26, but we're looking to find quite a few. Well, it's wonderful weather for worms. Oh, perfect, 10 centimetres, look at that. Right, so now we need to have a bit of a rummage in our topsoil to see if there's any worms in there. Let's have a look. Isn't that? No. Yeah. I found one. Have you? Where? Let's have a look. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh well done. Why is it in that shape? Um, does it make channels for the um, yeah. for the roots to go? It's basically a big long tube and it, and it eats material at one end and it comes out the other end as, as their poo. <laughs> and as they burrow through the soil, they make little channels, which helps with drainage and aeration. And it also leaves spaces for roots to grow as well. So they really are like small plows as they charge through the soil. Right, worm facts, everyone. Pay attention. Earthworms eat dirt. They consume their own body weight in food every day. They don't have eyes, but light-sensitive cells scattered on their outer skin. Contrary to popular belief, if you cut a worm in half, you get one dead worm in two pieces. We've only found the shallow burrowing earthworms, now we want to get the deep burrowing earthworms to come out and so we can have a look at them. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to bring them up 
with a mild mustard solution. <laughs> this won't hurt them, it's just a slight irritant. So in goes the mustard and then you mix it up. You can That's shake it. hard than that. Oh, lovely. Look at that. Is there any left in the bottom? Let's have a look. That looks quite appetizing. Oh, that's really well mixed. Good. So now, if you want to pour it in our hole, right in there, but all the way over, just all the way around. That's it. That's it. And then that will drain down. And in a couple of minutes, we should get a few earthworms coming up to the top. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder what anyone else has got. Go on, let's go and see. This is a crater over here. <laughs> Only one worm. We've got loads of worms. Oh, we've got loads of worms. Oh, we've got 13. Rosy tip. Yeah. yeah. We got a rosy tip there as well over here. Think about this. <laughs> we got a blue grey worm over here. First one. That's Look at that. Come on, like it. Look at that. Hey, can I hold one? Oh, I know. I yeah, know. Yeah, they, 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 they very really rarely really grow yet. Yeah. So far, we've found six species of earthworm here. They may be small, but they're incredibly important. So get a wriggle on and start counting. George is here with his worms. Go on, show us your worms. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't under it or overestimate worms. I mean, this is what, this is the good stuff. That's what you want. This what? is, this is, you can turn, how, oh, come yeah. on. Yeah. Household waste yeah. into this amazing... Do you know what? I reckon they probably taste that. better than that yeah. chocolate, those, well, uh, those worms. There you go, have a, have a try. Yeah. No, I mean, it's very easy to make, and you can make a wormery on your yeah. own very simply. You can buy them on the, on the internet, but all you need is a box, basically, and you just throw in all your kitchen waste, eggshells, coffee grounds, weeds, and the worms get in there, and they make a wonderful leachate, the fluid... Right. And then you end up with something that looks like that. And then that... you end up with this fantastic soil for your compost, for your pot plants. Yeah. It is the most environmentally okay. friendly thing right. you can possibly Well, I tried do. that for a couple of years and I ended up with nothing that didn't resemble something from the bowels of hell. <laughs> <laughs> you do have awful. to... A little bit of TLC if they get... I gave it TLC. I love those worms and they <laughs> did nothing You have to put lots of food in, lots of eggshells, because they, they yeah. do like it being a bit alkaline. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, very easy to do. Yeah. Very, very easy. And yeah. they are the most important thing on the planet without... Yeah worms that the earth would be cold and sterile and in fact you can have this little desktop yeah. version of it if you, you can, really love yeah. your worms you can have There's that no in your, actual in worms your in desk there, but uh, you yes there are well, yes, there, there are worms in there them. there are worms in there. michael them. you're a worm fan uh, I, i've always been a worm fan yeah. my uh, my brother-in-law fraser uh, works for a company uh, who has a worm farm yeah. And he has to deliver boxes and boxes of worms in the back of his van. And he told me that his, uh, the, the, the back doors on his van opened one day on the motorway and all the boxes fell out and he had to be oh. scooping up the worms yeah, I mean, off the motorway oh, back into the van. It's nice, yeah, isn't it? Very, very <laughs> You'd have been happy with that. <laughs> well, George would George with element. Most exactly, yeah. <laughs> Details on uh, how to do your own uh, worm survey in your backyard on the, uh, on the uh, have a look on the website where, uh, George, you're also looking for people to yep. tell them about your bugs. Tell Bug you about week, their bugs. Bug week is back and this time we want to find the things that are in your homes. So if yeah. you're infested with anything creepy crawly, if you've got ants or slugs or maggot supplies, let us know. Okay, great. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Michael, I'm delighted to hear you're a proper South Walesian. You've got your still, your South Wales intact, accent is intact. Who are you going to play from South Wales? Neil well, Kinnock. <laughs> Neil Kinnock, yeah, no, uh, I'll do Catherine Zeta Jones next, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, eh? I don't think yeah. it's possible. Do you know what? Do, I wouldn't put it past you. Listen, yeah. it's um, great to It has, it's been meet a real you. pleasure meeting you. Damned United, of course, is out on Friday. Yep. yep. And well, if you're not a football fan, watching. do not let it stop you from going because yeah. it is uh, really it's brilliant. Is Michael a great is superb. Watch. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, much, Michael. Thank you. You're going to have the worms or the chocolate? Yeah, I'm not sure which to go for. All right. We'll leave that one up to you. I think I'll eat my own face. Yeah. Who have we got tomorrow? Tomorrow. Got Bill Nye, yeah. Marvellous. Join us then. Yeah. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>